Great. Thank you so much um, to the organizers for having me here and be part of this group. And thanks to my fellow panelists for their, for their presentations. And thanks to you all for being here. Uh, my name is Matthew Nock, and I'm going to talk about, consistent with the theme, using intensive longitudinal monitoring to, as the prior speakers did, but I'm going to zoom in and talk a little bit more clinically about using this approach to better understand, predict, and prevent suicidal behavior. And this, speaking with this panel, I'm reminded of how fortunate and excited I am to be part of this group, where we have people who are using this approach who are coming from really different backgrounds. Even within psychology and mental health, we're, we're focused on different problems, and so it's really exciting to hear different, different angles on this. I'm going to use my time to zoom in and talk about one specific clinical problem. That's the problem of suicide. So why focus on this problem? This is a uh, very complex, very complicated problem, suicide, that's been plaguing us for literally thousands of years. And it's one that continues to be a big issue. It's the 10th leading cause of all death in the US, second leading killer among those ages 15 to 34. And whereas many of our leading causes of death, the, for them, the mortality rate has dropped precipitously over the past 100 years, the suicide rate has remained the same. So deaths by cancers, accidents, tuberculosis, pneumonia, and so on have dropped. The suicide rate in 2017 is virtually the same as it was in 1917. So we haven't made such progress. We have made progress. When I mention that we haven't made a lot of progress, people who work in this research area tend to get upset. So to acknowledge the progress we've made, we've identified some key risk factors. We've identified some promising interventions. In terms of clinicians, how many clinicians are here who see patients who are potentially suicidal? OK, good. So maybe three quarters or so. So you know what a difficult problem this is. Uh, I would say our progress on this topic has been slow and in many ways stagnant. You needn't take my word for this. I have some data to bear on this issue. So our group, uh, led by uh, Joe Franklin and friends, recently did a meta-analysis where we examined how well we do in predicting suicide over the past 50 years. So a meta-analysis of all the studies we can find that tried to prospectively predict suicide attempt and suicide death. And what I'm going to show is how big are our odds ratios in predicting these outcomes. And we would hope and expect that over time, we're identifying more and more powerful predictors. And that's, in fact, not what we see. So we see a flat or, in some ways, decreasing uh, pattern here. Why might this be? Well, if we look across time, what we see is that we've been looking at the same risk factors over and over and over again. So the top five risk factor categories for the past 50 years have been demographic factors, DSM symptoms, whether, whether, they, whether they be internalizing or externalizing, prior self-injurious thoughts and behaviors, and negative life events. And in fact, in 75 to 80% of all prediction cases or all analyses, we've looked at one of these five factors. So through this lens, it's perhaps not surprising that if we're looking at the same predictors and we're using largely the same methods, small case control studies, we shouldn't be surprised that we're getting the same results. So we need a new approach. We need to do something different. What might that be? I would argue, I think we would argue, that we need to get better at zooming in on the, the natural unfolding of mental health and behavioral problems, and in this case, the suicidal process. And, we, and in the terms of suicide and related health risk behaviors, we need to get better at identifying imminent risk, short-term risk prediction. For the majority of us who work clinically, what we want to know, practically speaking, is if we're seeing a patient, is this person going to try and kill him or herself today or tomorrow or the next day? What did the data have to say about that? What, what has research told us about this short-term prediction? Well, if we look back to the meta-analysis I just described and plot out how much time passes from when we measure a potential risk factor until we observe the suicide outcome of interest, this is how, how much time passes between those two over the past 50 years of research. Looking from counterclockwise 12 o'clock to 9 o'clock, you see about a quarter of studies make this prediction over 10 years or more, another 22% over uh, five to 10 years, another 30%, one to five years. What percentage of studies look at the time period that's most of interest to us as clinicians? Let's call it zero to 29 days. One tenth of 1% of all available studies. So literally 99.9% .9 of studies look at a time period that just is not of use to us uh, clinically in terms of working with the patient who's in front of us. So we need to get better at measuring the moment by moment, hour by hour, day by day unfolding of this clinical phenomenon. And for my money, this is probably the, the, the biggest limiting factor in psychiatry and in psychology uh, science right now, is that we don't observe the thing that we're interested in. If you think about virtually every other area of science, 
advances are made by finding some phenomenon of great importance, be it planets or insects or, or chemicals or, or biological factors, and we carefully observe them in time and place. And we poke them and prod them and observe what happens as a result. We don't do that in mental health research. We ask people questions. We might do a brain scan at one point in time, or if we're really out in front, several points in time, or we'll bring people into our laboratories and measure them in pretty artificial, somewhat bizarre circumstances and try and make inferences about what's happening out in the real world. We haven't gone out into the real world and measure the things that are of importance. But fortunately, over the past few years, we've all become cyborgs. And we all now are equipped with these digital appendages that we're all wearing right now that allow us to do what we've come to know as digital phenotyping. And this has been talked about already uh, today and, and for the few previous years in this conference and in others, and so I won't belabor these points. But collecting this moment by moment, hour by hour, second by second data, we can capture really fine grain information about how people move in and out of what are manic episodes, depressive episodes, substance use urges, self-injurious thoughts and behaviors. This decreases the influence of recall bias, allows us to observe processes as they're unfolding outside the lab, outside the interview room, allows us to test theories out in the world, as I mentioned earlier. And in the area of suicide, this is especially important, provides opportunities for intervening before the problem occurs. If you think about our most effective psychological treatments for suicide, suicidal behavior, and there's not many and they're not that strong, all of them, DBT, CBT, have been shown in our best cases, to decrease the risk of reattempt among people who have made a suicide attempt. We don't have yet treatments that can prevent people from making suicide attempts to begin with, which is really important because about half of people who die by suicide die on their first attempt. This approach may help us remedy that by finding people and intervening before it's too late. So we did our first study on this about 10 years ago, and we, in a very cutting edge way, equipped people with something called a Palm Pilot uh, and we asked them to collect data twice a day. This is a sample of adolescents. We monitored their suicidal thinking and their self, non-suicidal self-injurious behavior. They would use a, a little stylus, which to those who are younger is like a small pen, and they'd click their, their, their Palm Pilot and tell us what was happening. They'd put it in this cradle, upload the data through their, their modem, and so on. Uh, and we learned a little bit about suicidal thoughts and self-injurious behaviors. Slightly more recently, we wanted to measure things like heart rate and so on, and so we had people wear these shirts, life shirt, under their clothes with a big fanny pack battery and so on. Technology has developed a lot in the past, in just in the past few years. Now, as, as you all well know, all of us are walking around with smartphones, and so this allows us to collect data on suicidal thoughts and related phenomenon much, much more easily. So in some recent studies, we've been pinging people four times a day, six times a day, and asking them about their suicidal thoughts over, let's say, the past four weeks. And so our studies ask people questions that look like this. Right now, what are your, how, how strong is your desire to kill yourself, your intention to kill yourself, your ability to resist the urge to kill yourself? And just in a, in a crassly descriptive way, we first want to map out what variability in suicidal thinking looks like day to day, person by person. Meaning, if you have 50 people, 100 people who say, I'm having serious thoughts of killing myself, what do those thoughts actually look like? We really don't know. Are they high? Are they low? Do they vary from moment to moment, hour to hour, and so on? So the first data we collected, using this approach look like this. So these are roughly 50 different boxes. Each box is a different person. From left to right, this is a one month period. And from bottom to top, this is severity of suicidal thinking. And this is a study led by a recent postdoc of ours, Evan Kleiman, who's now an assistant professor at Rutgers. What you see is there's a lot of variability both within people and between people. And so Evan and I and, and others on our team put these on the floor of our lab and stared at them for a few hours to try and see if there are any patterns in the data, or any profiles or subtypes, we didn't see any. I hope that you don't either, because you've only seen these for a few, few seconds. Uh, we took these same, we submitted these data to a latent profile analysis. I'm gonna show you the same exact boxes, but reorganized. What we see are five different profiles or potential subtypes of suicidal thinking. So same figures, just reorganized. In green on top, you see people who are have low mean, low variability suicidal thinking. So again, all of these folks have serious thoughts of suicide, but those in green on a scale from zero to 10 are reporting a lot of zero, 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 one, zero, two, and so on. People in yellow are low mean, high variability, so they're a little bit peakier. People in purple, moderate mean, moderate variability. In red, high mean, low variability, never coming back down to zero. And people in blue, high mean, high variability. This is one sm relatively small sample. We collected another in totally independent sample, did a latent profile analysis, saw the same five profiles, suggesting maybe this is a robust finding. What group do you think is most likely to have made a recent suicide attempt? 
Green? Red? So the folks in red were most likely to have made a recent suicide attempt. High mean, low variability, perhaps because of lack of relief, one might intuit. People who are suicidal, if you ask them, why did you make a suicide attempt? The number one reason is I wanted to escape from some uh, aversive, intolerable state. So maybe this is an intolerable pattern. What we don't know, though, is what this looks like moving forward beyond a four-week period. What happens subgroup by subgroup? Do people move from green to yellow to purple to red? Are red the most high risk for making a future attempt? We don't know. We hope, we hope to soon find out uh, because we are uh, part of this U01 uh, network supported by NIH and in our, our um, study as part of this project, we're collecting data from 300 adolescents at Franciscan Children's Hospital right in town and 300 adults from Mass General Hospital as they pass through a psychiatric emergency room visit or an inpatient stay and we follow them for the next six months. The reason we're doing this is we're getting people, people who just leave a psychiatric hospitalization are at highest risk of suicide attempt and suicide death. So there's a huge increase in suicide death and suicide attempt in that uh, hospital discharge period. So we're following people who are having suicidal thoughts as they're passing through this high-risk period. And we're collecting data not just using active smartphone um, surveys, but we're collecting passive data using uh, many of the methods that were described earlier, GPS, accelerometer, um, call and text data, Bluetooth data. So this is uh, GPS data from the same person on two different days, as you would see overlaid onto like a Google map. The first day, they're moving around quite a bit. The second day, they're uh, not moving around very much. This is a slide. Uh, borrowed by our collaborator on this, J.P. Onella. We're collecting call and text data. This is a, a figure showing from, sorry, these rows are people during a hospital stay. From left to right, these heat maps are showing how many calls and texts are outgoing and incoming. And what we're seeing in our initial pass is the more call and, more texts you're sending and receiving, the lower your odds of suicidal thinking on that day. Perhaps the more socially connected you are, the less, the less suicidal you are. Can't infer directionality from here, but first pass through the data. We're also having people wear the Empatica E4 uh, bracelet while they're in the hospital, and we're collecting information about electrodermal activity, heart rate variability, accelerometer, skin temperature, and there's an event marker on this device. They hit, hit a button, and it marks the data, and we can see to what extent are um, heart rate, skin conductance, accelerometer, and so on, predicting suicidal thoughts or behaviors. In our initial pass, what we're seeing is these are AUCs for using today's data to predict suicidal thinking tomorrow, whether you have a button pressed tomorrow. Electrodermal activity doesn't do anything. Heart rate variability does better. Accelerometer data, moving a, a lot, a moving around a lot the night before so far at a first simple pass is best predictor of next day uh, ideation. Perhaps the more agitated, uncomfortable you are, that's predictive of uh, the emergence of suicidal thinking the, the next day. The goal here and the goal with this project is to use these various channels of data to dynamically predict periods of increasing suicidal thoughts and suicide attempts during this high-risk period with the hope of being able to intervene once we identify people in this period. So I'll talk very briefly about uh, one example of a recent digital intervention. So for those who work uh, clinically with suicidal people, if a, person, a, pa a patient is out in the world and at risk, you instruct them to give you a call, I, I would hope and expect. If they're not able to reach a clinician, we often encourage people to call crisis services, call 1-800-SUICIDE, contact crisis text line, and so on. However, however, a recent study by one of our graduate students, Adam Jaruzewski, found that nearly 80% of people say they're not going to call that hotline when, re when referred. So how can we increase people's likelihood of reaching out to others when they're in distress? We recently did a study teamed up with Rob Morris and friends at a platform called COCO, which briefly is a, he describes as a safety net for social networks. So this is a platform running in the background of other social media platforms or text-based apps. And what it does is use machine learning algorithms to identify people in distress. And we did a study testing whether we could increase people's likelihood of reaching out when they're in distress. This is the beauty of technology. This only took about five weeks to do. And in this time, we screened 40,000 people, found about 1,500 who were in distress. Those folks were randomly assigned to get nothing, our control condition, or nothing more than the referral, versus a barrier reduction intervention, which is a very brief introduction trying to identify and then eliminate potential barriers to reaching out to others. And so it looks like this. These are screenshots from my phone. Uh, co the Coco bot is in gray on the left. My responses are in blue. The text is very small, I apologize. Uh, briefly it says, okay, uh, you're in distress. What country are you in? I say I'm in the US. They say, okay, call one of these hotlines or text lines. I say, okay. It then says, are you gonna, 
call one of these lines. Are you very likely or not likely? If you say I'm very likely, you're done. If you say I'm not likely to call, it says, okay, thanks for letting me know. Uh, there are many reasons people might not call one of these lines. Here are some potential reasons that you might not call. I don't want to, I just want to chat. I, don't, I can't use my phone. I don't want the police to come. That's a common one. So if I push no police, I then get a little response from the bot saying, well, most calls to crisis centers don't end with the police or paramedics showing up. This is extremely, extremely rare, like less than 1% rare for many, many crisis lines. And I click OK. That's the intervention. So very brief, fully automated intervention. And what we found is that people who get that intervention have a 23% increase in the likelihood of calling a crisis line in the next few hours. So it's nice, what's nice is this is really brief, fully automated, totally scalable. So the larger goal is identify people using intensive longitudinal monitoring who are having suicidal thoughts, making suicide attempts, and using this approach to better understand and predict and then prevent episodes of, of suicide attempts before they occur. I didn't talk about a lot of the key challenges because I don't want to, because uh, I don't know the, the answers to them. But if, we, if and when we find that people are at risk, what, what do we do beyond this? Uh, do we intervene immediately? Do we give the patient or the or participant information about the risk score? Do we give it to the clinician? Is that okay to do? What are the ethics of monitoring people and then testing out different interventions in the background? Whether in a research study or on a social media platform or, or, or elsewhere. Maybe these are some things that we'll talk about during uh, the panel discussion. I want to end by uh, giving a brief plug for those who want to hear more and much, much better uh, work along these lines. I encourage you to check out several of our trainees who are presenting in, a, in the poster panel session tonight. Alex Milner is going to give a fantastic poster about this escape learning task that he created. I mentioned suicide is performed to escape from some aversive context. He's created this behavioral task that pretty quickly measures people's tendency to want to escape and looked at this at Franciscan Children's Hospital with uh, suicidal adolescents and young adults. Uh, Becky Fortgang is, has been using our smartphone data to model the association between self-control and later emergence of suicidal thinking. Daniel Coppersmith looking at connectedness, so those call and text data that I showed you, the results have changed in our more recent analyses, and I'm not going to tell you what we found. You'll have to go to Daniel's poster to find out. And then tomorrow, Shirley Wang and David Miller are going to present. Shirley, I'm taking a lot of these smartphone data and putting them together in a way to better predict uh, suicidal thoughts using uh, several different machine learning approaches, and David Moe with a different example of how we might use social media uh, to better intervene when people are at risk. Wendy, in an earlier talk, mentioned that it's really our students who are, are, are much smarter and better and doing the more cutting edge work, and that is absolutely the case in this group. So I'd strongly encourage you to check out these folks, look at their posters, collaborate with them. If you're in the position to do so, hire them. <laughs> and so I want to end by thanking uh, those folks as well as our larger research team and our funders and other collaborators. Thank you very much.